Well, hello there, and welcome to Radio Free Escape Kathiki. Well, what am I speaking about? Like, what's going on? Like, I don't know what, I haven't been listening to this whole thing. We're going to be talking about war crimes, and who is a war criminal and who ain't. So, that well, was... I was not prepared for this discussion. Well, I mean, it's just like life. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't know what you guys were even talking about. Well, we're going to talk about war crimes. But Eddie, you don't have to talk if you don't want to. Uh, but here we are. Well, I, I was, what I was more intrigued about to hear about was uh, the governor. Judge Young for governor and stuff. But, I, uh, I don't think we can talk about that because that's self-promotion. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. Um, we can sure talk about what just happened because that wasn't self-promotion. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll settle that as we get to that. Hey, hold on just one second. We're going to play what the... What wasn't self-promotion? The, uh, the, uh, the vaccine stuff? Yeah, well, that's that's oh, a different that's issue. What, that's what I wanted to hear about, actually. That's what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear Jeff's views on that and uh, in depth. But uh, so, yeah, I wasn't prepared to talk about foreign policy, but I wanted to hear Jeff's views on the pharma stuff because I I never actually heard his views on this. So, uh, okay, well, um, I tell you what, uh, just hey, you have a couple seconds to uh, to gather your thoughts, and Jeff and I will say hello and, and give the legal ID and everything like that. So, wait, 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 gather my thoughts about what? <laughs> whatever you want to. Hold on. Okay, so this is WRFL uh, FM, uh, Radio Free Escapicathiki. It's the top of the hour. Um, you just heard a quite a few songs. So that first off, that was um, Lottie Lunya's ver- rendition of Pirate Jenny. As you're probably aware, there's hundreds of versions of Pirate Jenny. Everybody's convinced that their version's the best. They're all good. Every kind of woman needs revenge all over the world. Uh, then the Unicorns with Ready to Die, which I thought went along well. Uh, then Jesus Jones with Trust Me, then The Breeders with The She, then Pavement with Embassy Row, finally Archers of Loaf with their cover of um, Red Sovine's Big Joe and Phantom 309. Most people know that song from Tom Waits covering it, but Tom Waits is by far the inferior version of the three listed. So um, let's just skip a generation there anyway and this is jeff sebesta and i'm here with jeff young and with our twitter friend bane and who knows who else shows up and today we are here to uh discuss war crimes and war criminals and then i guess probably the conversation will straight up as it always does uh hello jeff hi jeff how's things <laughs> things are fine had a nice thanksgiving yeah me too how's the volume level uh, it looks like it's way too high, actually. Do you oh. have your headphones on? I never wear headphones. Oh. If yeah. anybody's at uh, 88.1, we're on 88.1 all the way to the left side of the dial, and if anybody wants to call us, it's 859-257-WRFL. We will try to put you on the air if you want to be on the air, but you know how it is with oh, technical stuff. Volume. Yeah, uh, yeah, your your volume's very low, but I'm, I'm going to plug you in. Uh, tell you what, Jeff, why don't you give us a, a short introduction into the topic of war crimes yeah. and what a war crime is while I figure out the technical stuff. Okay, so the fundamental thing to know about international law since 1945, a long time ago, is that the UN Charter is the basis of, of international law today, most of it. There are other things like the Geneva Conventions and, you know, uh, you're not supposed to torture prisoners and that kind of thing, but the UN Charter has the, the widest perspective on what uh, a war crime is. So there's not, what you're saying is there's not really exactly a definitive answer on what is and is not a war crime, or is the UN's uh, Charter considered definitive for, I guess the signatories are every nation in the world, right? Almost all, um, yeah. Uh, so there are war crimes that uh, nations and army and yeah, uh, politicians, presidents, uh, premiers, dictators commit. And the main war crime, uh, the supreme international crime, is aggression. Now, where does it say that, though? It says that in the. UN Charter, Article 2, okay. and in the, well, let me just summarize that. No country shall um, use force or threaten the use of force against any other country 
Uh, and and that's that's basically Article Two of the UN Charter. That's the fundamental prohibition against aggression. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm looking at it now. It's Article Two, um, sub four. Actually, could you switch around to a different microphone, uh, or could you try maybe that microphone, or that one doesn't stick up straight? Because that way I can have this one pointed at me while I'm looking at the computer. That's a constant problem in the studio. I don't know if you realize this, but we are human beings in a physical space that does not always cooperate. In any case. Article 2 of the Charter of the United Nations, uh, item 4, says, All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Right. Now that uh, arose, that article, in fact the entire UN Charter, came out of World War II. Mm -hmm. There was no UN before 1945, uh, the year that World War II ended with the defeat of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan in the Pacific. So the purpose of the United Nations, the main purpose, is to prevent another world conflagration like World War II from ever happening again. And so that's, that's why the UN exists. It's, it's the, the main reason underlying why international law exists, to prevent aggression, and if aggression occurs, to take action among many countries to stop it. And so where is it spelled out? What precisely, I mean, like, so when we say something's a war crime, we're just talking about this general principle of force, or are there actual le yeah. legislation? Yeah, there are, there are war crimes uh, at a lower level than aggression. So in so where does right after World War II, are? right after World War II, there were trials mm -hmm. of the Nazi officials, uh, including military officers and including... Uh, some propagandists like Goebbels, who was uh, hanged or committed suicide before hanging. Um, yeah, didn't. Yeah, he did commit suicide. <laughs> um, yeah. For conspiracy to commit aggression against various countries, so Germany went around went around in the in, you know starting in 1939 by invading Poland. That's aggression. He's well, the Sudetenland in 38, right? In yeah, Chips but that was, uh, that was the threat of force. Hitler said, if, if you don't give us half of, you know, Czechoslovakia or, or the Sudetenland. Oh, I see. Okay, I see um, the difference. You'll, you're, they're going to be invaded and a uh -huh. lot of people will get killed and so on. That is why the threat of force is prohibited by the Article 2 of the United Nations because it's something Hitler did to get cheap victories over a number of areas okay. next to Germany. All right, that makes sense. Hey, hold that thought for just a second. I finally figured out how to play the talk show disclaimer, and that, that is important. So this is 88.1 WRFL. Here's the talk show disclaimer. <laughs> The following program contains views, ideas, and opinions that have been produced by the host DJ and their guests and are not reflective of the views of WRFL or its underwriters. For questions, comments, or concerns, please email programming at wrfl.fm. Don't get me wrong, the underwriters are lovely people. Uh, so if you are listening along with Twitter, um, the two people that we have in the Twitter space right now are actually known to us. So I have just put the microphone on, and then I put it next to the microphone. So if one of you all would like to try saying something, we'll see how that works. <laughs> it's low tech around How about here. Bane? Uh, he, he muted himself? I don't know if he's missing. Uh, and Milan's there, too. I don't really know these folks uh, too well, but I liked them. Now, both of you, if you... Um, use bad words i i have a certain set of skills that make me a nightmare for people like you uh oh gosh twitter just stopped <sighs> okay Ain't technology grand yeah well i i warned everybody that this was probably not going to work did i not <laughs> you did um 
Yeah, I was very clear about that. Okay, anyway, well... Um, People can call in, right? Yes, 88.1 WRFL, 859-257 WRFL. Very easy to remember. Um, I can't get back to the space that I already that I'm already got started. Well, you know what? We will just call that a um, dismal failure <laughs> <laughs> and move on. Okay, so I All want right, to know so, so where in the law it says what a war crime is and what if well, somebody says. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there are lesser war crimes, but, but what, it, what I, was, I was talking about the Nuremberg trials uh -huh. and, and the Tokyo trials after World War II. Uh, the judgment. The final judgment of the Nuremberg Tribunal mm -hmm. included the sentence, uh, aggression is not only a war crime, it is the supreme international crime mm -hmm. that contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole, which means that when, uh, say, for example, uh, in 2003, uh, the United States invaded Iraq, that was aggression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Iraq had not conquered Kentucky, had not <laughs> conquered any state on, on the Atlantic coast. USA. Ha had not conquered the entire country or the lower 48. Yeah, it really hadn't conquered anything. And uh, Iraq did not have a fleet uh, uh, mm -hmm. halfway across the Atlantic Ocean or, you know, a few miles offshore uh, or a fleet of bombers heading straight toward the United States mm -hmm. with aggressive intent. So, okay, so so by uh, invading Iraq, uh, the Bush administration specifically committed a war crime. Now, how do we know? Yeah. Because there's always the a question supreme about it. international crime. But which members of the Bush administration? Where? How far does well, complicity the, go the in that president, one? The buck stops on the president's desk. Okay. But, but other people certainly conspired with him, and it would be up to a tribunal, if one were ever convened, to try the, the uh, members of the United States government who committed aggression against Iraq in 2003. I just want more clarity here, because uh, I want... I want to know what the, you know, if you break well, a law in America, it's like, you know, KRS 122.44, yeah. no mopery in a moped, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, there there have to be, like, specifically enumerated, thou shalt not. Yeah. Okay, so, so lesser war crimes on the battlefield. Um, Where is this written, though? Geneva Conventions. Okay, so the Geneva Conventions are... are they are part of... International law. Okay, and they, international they apply to everyone. So international law is uh, is agreed to by the Charter of the UN uh -huh. and is administered by the UN according to the Geneva Convention and various other conventions, or is it just the Geneva? No, Convention? it's like there are two separate bodies of law, different dealing with different classes of violations. Oh, okay. So the Geneva Conventions actually predate 1945. Mm -hmm. They existed long before, and they talk about well, if there is. A prisoner who is lying wounded, you're not allowed to kill them. Oh, yeah. That type of thing. Well, I know why you brought that one up. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, sad times. Uh, so that I, would be a violation okay, well, actually, of you know the what? Geneva Conventions. Um, okay, no, no, no. Well, let's, let's start there. Okay, so let's say that we had a situation where there were two countries in a conflict, Mm -hmm. and uh, the sources of the conflict were murky, to put it mildly, mm. and then one country ex one country is caught on video executing the prisoners of war of another country. In that case, you know, let's just say country A and country B. Like, mm -hmm. country A... Uh, a country A is shown to have prisoners on video uh, executing prisoners of... Con uh, former soldiers, prisoners of war of country B. Mm-hmm. Who in country A is now responsible for those war crimes? Uh, well, okay, so a couple of questions. Is, has that country agreed to, to be under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court? If they have, mm -hmm. then uh, I guess uh, some country, some, anyone with information can file a complaint against the commanding officer on the scene, uh, and 
and also the uh, that person's commanding officer all the way up to the leader of the country, they, they could all be indicted for war crimes. And ideally they would be. Um, I mean, I guess. Yeah, well, the I United guess, yeah. States has never accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC. Um, so when the United States commits war crimes... Um, well, in the, the the world, the UN, the ICC feels it does not have mm -hmm. the legal right to uh, indict anybody. Uh, yeah, actually, in this case, both nation, both nation A and nation B, um, ICC lacks jurisdiction. Um, Huh. Well, Is this your example? example? Yeah, in my example, both of them last, lack jurisdiction. All right. Well, most countries are have decided or, or uh, yeah, um, agreed to become under the jurisdiction of, of the ICC, but a few have not. Mm -hmm. The United States is the biggest exceptional country. Um, yeah. There's yes. your American exceptionalism for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we don't care about your international law. We have, we have something uh, superior to that, which is a rules-based order. <laughs> <laughs> Which we just make up the rules. <laughs> when, when someone asks the question you just did, what are the rules? Uh -huh. The United States says, uh, well, we'll tell you uh, when, it, when we feel like it. Yeah, the rules are we win. I, I mean, okay, but this is, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so easy to get me distracted and you know it. But I, I really want to, I want to spend this time like hammering out as much as possible, like hard and fast rules for who is and who is not a war criminal to the best of our ability. All right, here's another example. Uh -huh. uh, Lieutenant William Calley uh -huh. during the Vietnam War uh -huh. was a commanding officer of a group, I don't know, a platoon or something, mm -hmm. uh, and he ordered them to just start slaughtering the, the uh, civilians in a village. Of My Lai, yeah. Women and children, My Lai. Yeah. Uh, My Lai, I don't know if there were any men there, but... Uh, a whole lot of people got slaughtered. Mm -hmm. At one point, some U.S. soldiers on a helicopter mm -hmm. uh, s uh, finally stopped the killing. Yeah. And they're heroes. Yes, very much so. So William Calley was tried and convicted of murder and war crimes and... Um, Killing civilians, but he's not. But since America isn't ICC, isn't um, is convicted by the U.S. government. Okay, so the U.S. government can convict people of war crimes. Yes. Does the, so the U.S. government has war crime statutes? Yeah. Okay, so like specific crimes that are committed in war, like I guess because we don't have legal jurisdiction in Vietnam, so technically, it would need a different law to cover what happened, I suppose. Well, the United States has laws to govern the, the conduct of soldiers in the field. Mm -hmm. And so one of those laws is you shall not go around massacring civilians. Yeah, he was, he was convicted of premeditated murder of 22 civilians. Okay. And, uh, oh, oh, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter did not cover himself with glory in this. What did he do? <sighs> Many in the United States were outraged by what they perceived to be an overly harsh sentence for Cali. Georgia's governor, Jimmy Carter, instituted America, American Fighting Man's Day and asked Georgians to drive for a week with the lights on. So, uh, and what, what happened? Was, was his sentence reduced or something? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, <coughs> you know, all yeah. countries have, po have their own politics. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, we're not really on the... In, there's no particular danger of Americans um, being held liable for war crimes anytime in the near future. More's the pity. Um, okay, but, but, you know, in my opinion, yeah. uh, Cali was like, um, just used as an example. Yes. Because the, the uh, rules of engagement, mm -hmm. the people who uh, sent out these bombing missions, they were bombing whole villages every day. Oh, like Curtis LeMay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah the, the, top, the top, you know, was he the uh, Secretary of the Air Force or something? Yeah, I don't know, uh, I mean, or, I don't know, um, I don't know if I've ever told you the story, but William Calley, Lieutenant William Calley, was a friend of a friend. Oh. Yeah, um, I mean, not a really good friend, but a fellow I met in South Dakota uh, many years ago. 
uh, I'm sure he's uh, gone now, but um, he actually knew William Calley and served with him in Vietnam, but not during my lie. Uh, Melee, sorry, I'm pronouncing it cor- incorrectly. Anyway, um, he said that he and Callie set a lake on fire together. For fun? I think, well, they, <laughs> they, he was under the impression that Callie had orders to do so. And Callie, he's, he said that Callie was known for having sealed orders <laughs> that he didn't share. And that the trial for uh, Mila, um came to an abrupt stop when he threatened to produce his orders <laughs> so i mean Mila is that's a, intriguing it's a it's but, a truly senseless man uh, basically he yeah. was a fall guy because yeah. the 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 real war criminals were the president mm-hmm. the secretary of defense you know if there was a national security advisor uh, in the 1960s yeah mcnamara was still in i think then the secretary of defense yeah he was uh, and and the president uh, would have been johnson yeah johnson oh you know what actually one of the reasons this came out is because it, the massacre happened at the end of the johnson regime and then the um investigation was taken up by nixon so that probably explains why it made the news at all yeah in any case, they were the true war criminals, mm-hmm. Ma- and I would say the worst one of all was President Johnson, LBJ, yeah. for escalating that war and keeping it going. Yeah. Wait, now, you, you've said often on other occasions that it's nearly impossible for a legislator to be a war criminal. Yeah, yeah, the, the uh, rationale is they're just one of 435 votes. Yeah. They themselves do not order a bombing crew to go off and bomb a city yeah they just pr- apportion the money for it um, they, they provide the money and what should happen is uh the president who's expected to sign these bills is supposed to uh, say you know talk with the attorney general of the united states at that time and uh and go to and, and and make a public statement to Congress saying, you have authorized funds mm-hmm. uh, and you expect me to commit war crimes. And I am not allowed to do that. I refuse to do it. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to use these <coughs> funds mm-hmm. to um, load up the planes with bombs, to send off the... The yeah. mission. I'm not going to do it because it, it would violate uh, the Geneva Conventions. You're not allowed to bomb civilians. Yeah, yeah. Although that's um, what should happen. We we're having this problem in recent wars where uh, with the Ukraine. Yeah, where people are putting military uh, equipment in civilian areas, and in some cases even co- keeping civilians hostage, specifically so that this, they can say civilians were killed when people return fire on them. Right. And that's. But but so if if we had any presidents who knew the law, possibly Obama did mm-hmm. or does. And was committed to upholding the law, which Obama surely was not. No, he certainly wasn't. Uh, Obama should have said to Congress, uh, no, I'm not going to uh, order war crimes, not on my watch, not during my term of office. Yeah, if any of them had done so. I mean, if Trump had done so, if Biden had done so. You know, it's the that's one of the great dreams of pacifism is that... <laughs> One day the government or the the governor or the general, the president will just wake up in the morning and say, you know what, this is stupid. I don't want to do it anymore. Right. And it never happens. And it's a great mystery why it doesn't. Um, it's not pacifism. I mean, it could be. It could be suddenly a, yeah. a president, sitting president, becomes converted to pacifism yeah. somehow. It's a jolly thing. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's more like the just war doctrine mm-hmm. uh, developed millennia ago by saint augustine well okay so that that's that is the thing though like you're you're um so you're you're really constructing um a legal argument here Uh uh-huh uh that that ranges from a a wide variety of um sources like okay can you is there a specific law that says legislators can't be held responsible for war crimes 
because you were talking about Goebbels a minute. Uh, Goebbels, not Goebbels. Um, yeah, he was in the executive branch of the Nazi but his, German government. His job was as a propagandist. I yes, mean, it's it's propaganda rare. Propaganda can kill. Well, yeah, but uh, so if a um, in the in the um, CSA, one of the most dire criminals was Henry Wigfall, who was a um, a, a representative from Texas, Confederate States of America. Yeah, he, um, and so I mean, like obviously after after secession, there's no question, right? If you're serving in the CSA government, uh, oh no, 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 we'll get to that in a second. Okay, <laughs> right. but Wigfall was by far one of the most dire propagandists, and he was a sitting representative the entire time. So if there was somebody like Goebbels. Who was a sitting okay. representative? Would they be? No, they wouldn't be exempt. Yeah. Uh, sitting representatives have the responsibility to uh, speak and vote on proposed legislation. Mm -hmm. All right, but then you get Charlie Wilson. Char Charlie Wilson's war. Another one of, United of States Carter's mistakes. Yeah, involved in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah funding and supplying and training the Mujahideen, mm -hmm. the Islamist terrorists, Osama bin Laden, in <sighs> Afghanistan, yeah. fighting against Soviet troops who were there. Igniting a cycle of pain that is still going today. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's fuzzy to me. I'm not real clear on whether Charlie Wilson, um, by going beyond talking and voting on the floor of the House, yeah. uh, when it, whether, by going beyond that, whether he would be considered a war criminal or not. It, he, it, maybe he is. Maybe would he, he was. Would you consider... Um, oh, shoot, I had a good question and I lost it. This um, is, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton? Yeah, when absolutely. When they were senators? Yeah. Well, well, when they were senators, there you go. Actually, Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton were both uh, ferocious cheerleaders for the Iraq That's war. That's right. That's uh, right. Yeah. And so, you know, this hypothetical court, um, uh, not Nuremberg, but some other trial. So you're, you're, trial, you're so thinking that someday there will be a tribunal, and that's the only way this I'm would happen. I'm saying there, there could be. Yeah. But if we're, or we would sign the ICC and just give them over peacefully? Yeah, right. No, yeah, that's a nice idea. That could happen. Hold on just a second. Um, I'm going to answer the phone. Please talk more about war crimes while I do so. Okay. Hello. WRK. So Charlie Wilson, who uh, the, there was some nice movie made of him about him, and um, he did all kinds yeah, of things in secret to uh, supply Osama bin Laden and his Al Qaeda band with weapons. Um, uh, uh, well, technically, the United States was neutral in the conflict between uh, Islamic rebels, or whatever you want to call them, <laughs> and Soviet forces. I agree. Okay, uh, I'm going to get back to the conversation, but thank you very much, and I will mention what you said. the government of Afghanistan. All right, man. Thanks uh, for calling. The Appreciate United it. States was technically neutral and had no business sending weapons to one of the sides. Oh, to Afghanistan? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just, for a second, thank you very much for the call, sir. Uh, we agree sending $40 billion a year to various countries that are um, doing things that are just clearly crimes against humanity, such as, for example, Israel and their apartheid policy towards uh, Palestine is a terrible idea. Um, your comment about dual citizenship is a little bit murkier, and we will try to return to that in a minute. But the overall idea that the American government sends aid, and I'm making air quotes when I do well, that. Well, military aid. Yeah, which is basically overpriced weapons that don't even really work that well. Um, I understand that what's happening in Ukraine right now is sort of an arms fair, and we aren't coming out very well, uh, far ahead, as I understand it. But that's neither here nor there. Okay, so um, going back to Charlie Wilson, since it was not the stated policy of the Carter administration to fund militant radicals of the most insane bands they could find, could that be considered a violation of the Logan Act? Of what? The Logan, the Logan Act? Act of 1799. <laughs> I'm sure it could. I mean... Uh, okay, briefly, that act mm -hmm. prohibits Americans from negotiating with other countries with which the United States has some kind of issue or dispute 
you know, or dispute with their neighbors or, you know, whether they're allies or mm -hmm. uh, adversaries. The Logan Act prohibits regular Americans and also yeah. legislators. Uh, everybody. It, everybody. It's very clear about it. It's just everybody. Everybody all except the president and the secretary of state. And they, it doesn't even really say that. It's just that there's some question there about what would happen if the president and the secretary of state had, or the state department had two different policies. But yes. Yeah. yeah but anyway, uh, prevents them from negotiating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, prevents them from saying... Uh, from go from flying to Taiwan and saying yes, yeah. we if if China invades Taiwan, we will send our troops and support yeah. you militarily and all that. Uh, now, if it's an act of Congress, there's mm -hmm. a, there's a bill currently before uh, the U.S. House and Senate called the Taiwan Policy Act of 2022. They may have to. <laughs> move that up to 2023 yeah. and change the title, uh, which would uh, just set in motion ongoing weapons flow yeah. from the United States to the authorities in Taiwan mm -hmm. with the purpose of defending them militarily. Uh, China... Well, not defending. I mean, they call it defending, but that's not what's defending. They're directly provoking a war. It's not defending well, for anything. It's China's attitude is that, <laughs> that that crosses their reddest line. Yeah. Uh, they, they have said, you know, for decades, the, uh, the government <laughs> of China, yeah. the uh, CPC, the Communist Party of China, not the CCP, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, the CPC has said innumerable times that if it becomes clear that Taiwan is seeking to become yeah. an independent country, break away from China, uh, which years ago everybody agreed Taiwan was part of China. Yeah. If, if, if the authorities in Taiwan make it clear that they're seeking independence and taking actions to do that, um, China would not be, uh, yeah. be held back. And I, I think China that, will not tolerate that. No, and I, I, I've, I've thought about that a lot. I think I understand the Chinese objection there because I think it's a little obscure to most Americans. They're like, well, why shouldn't Taiwan be free? It's not even, it's an island. Right. And they don't understand that what the rest of the world is sick about, uh, sick of America doing, like the world's critique of America, they don't, you know, they don't call us the great invader. They call us the great Satan. <laughs> And the people that call us the great Satan call us that because they were having a little border war with Iraq and we came in and armed the absolute worst people we could find on both sides of the border and turned it into an enormous conflagration that uh, rages to this day. And they take that very personally. And China is not in the slightest concerned about Americans invading Taiwan because we don't invade. What we do is we find the worst people we can and we sell them weapons. There you go. Yeah. And that is China does not think that America wants to, you know, make Taiwan the 51st state. Ty China thinks that America wants to find the craziest people that they can in Taiwan and give them weapons so that they'll start a war so that they can sell them more weapons. And meanwhile, all these people in Taiwan die exactly like in Ukraine right now. I mean, exactly. Right. right. So, I've, so there, yeah. the United States and other countries in Europe wanted to make Ukraine a member of NATO, yeah. which is a military alliance explicitly hostile to Russia. Yeah, not explicitly, but that's the problem, is that we're so untrustworthy. I mean, like, it, there's nothing in NATO's charter that specifically says Russia. It's just that the Russians would be fools to not see it coming. Right. You know, I mean, like um, uh, Scott Horton was talking about, all the effort that Russia went through to join NATO uh -huh. and to be rebuffed at every opportunity. Yeah. You know, they sort of had to come to the cautious presumption that, hey, since everybody gets to join NATO but us and you're arming everybody that, but us and on, NATO's... On Russia's borders. Yeah. And NATO's moving closer and closer and closer, but we're not allowed to join. And um, this isn't a joke to them. No. No, not at all. Yeah, this is very serious. Um, America's never, you know, I guess we're used to what we do, but other countries don't like it. <laughs> They're coming back to war crimes again. Yes. 
Um, I uh, was fortunate enough to be, to, uh, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts. I went to MIT for undergrad, and I happened to, well, I chose to take a couple courses from Noam Chomsky, mm-hmm. not on linguistics, but on um, political science. Yeah. And uh, that's where I learned about the UN Charter. And I also learned that every U.S. president since 1945 mm-hmm. uh, has been an aggressor and a war criminal, has violated that Article 2 of the U.N. Charter of, mm-hmm. use of uh, using or threatening force yep. against another country. Everyone has been a war criminal. Since 1976, that trend has continued. And what's happened is it's it's a less and less time between they take the oath of office Mm -hmm. in January of every fourth year uh, before they start committing their first war crimes. So with with, uh, Trump, it may have been, you know, a matter of a couple weeks after taking the oath of office, he uh, approved yeah, it was a, pretty fast, uh, a Navy attacking, SEAL yeah. raid against Yemen. Yeah. We're not at war with Yemen. Nope. Yemen has not attacked us, and he authorized a Navy SEAL. I think that was Trump's first war crime, and he went on mm-hmm. from there to commit many more Yes. in his four years. Yeah, yeah, and we have this firm no war criminals for president policy. <laughs> we do. Yeah. I mean, personally. Yeah. I do. Well, I mean, it, actually, it, it's funny you mentioned this because um, it comes it comes back around. Um, but we're still not getting. I mean, other than other than Article Two and the Geneva Convention, which it seems like most of these countries aren't even signatories to. Let me tie in the Just War Doctrine. Okay, that comes it's, from Saint Augustine, though. Right, but it's reflected in Article Fifty One okay. of the UN Charter which says that for, uh, for countries, member states of the UN, may use force in self-defense. So mm-hmm. uh, if... Uh, yeah, here we go. Nothing in the present charter shall impair the inherent in- right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. Measures taken by members in the exercise of this right of self-defense shall be immediately reported to the Security Cancer Council <laughs> and shall not in any way affect the authority and responsibility of the Security Council under the present charter to take at any time such action as it deems necessary in order to maintain or restore international peace and security. Yeah, that's a nice, a nice <laughs> article yeah. in that it clearly shows the intent of mm-hmm. the people who formed the United Nations in 1945. Uh, st- uh, aggression is prohibited mm-hmm. if it happens. Uh, one, the country who is attacked may use force to repel the attack, mm-hmm. rep- uh, stop the aggression. And two, the United Nations shall a Security Council shall immediately meet and figure out what's going on, who's the aggressor. Which is where we are now in Ukraine. The Security Council has been meeting, and it hasn't been particularly... It's been confused, right? Well, no, it's been... Uh, th- there's been a deadlock. Yeah. Uh, uh, Russia claims that NATO and the United States and the government and armed forces of Ukraine are the aggressors, and uh, the West... Mm-hmm. Uh, claims uh, obviously Russia sent its tanks in they're they're the aggressors you know on February 20 yeah second or 24th 24th mm-hmm. 2022 um i mean it looks like aggression it walks like aggression it must be uh yeah so so in the security council there is no nothing even close to unanimity about who the aggressor is in Ukraine. And because the Security Council has a single member can veto in the Security Council, right? Well, there are five permanent members, Mm -hmm. Russia, China, the United States, France, and Britain. Any one of those five countries can veto a resolution even if it has been approved by the five permanent members and, I don't know, ten... Yeah, there's ten others. Ten uh, uh, rotating 
countries that you know is Romania still in go in or out. Let's see, Albania, uh, Bra- Albania, nice, Brazil, Gabon, <laughs> Ghana, India, Ireland, Ireland, uh, Kenya, Mexico, Norway, and the UAE. Are you saying right now? Right now. Okay. I, I count three of those that are openly friendly to, um, to the Russian point of view here, maybe five. And okay. I, I see two that are just abjectly hostile to it, and I guess the UAE probably is too. But anyway, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's deadlocked. And as long as the conflict yeah. involves one of the five main ones, it's going to stay deadlocked. That's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so even if it's uh, 10 to 5 in favor mm. of a resolution, or, um, and if one of those five is a permanent member, then it's, uh, then it's a veto, then nothing happens. Yep. Or, even, or if it's even 14 to 1... If the one is the United States, yeah, <laughs> well, there's and, that, yeah. and they veto it, uh, still nothing happens. Mm-hmm. Except, what happens is what was going on on the ground before. Yeah, you know, it, it just means that the UN, as an international body, yeah. does not take action. But so the uh, the war in Ukraine continues, and the. Victor is determined by success or failure on the battlefield. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, but when it finally comes down, I, I really want to know, under what authority would the, would the soldiers of country A be charged for torturing prisoners of war, which they have been doing? And I mean... Geneva Conventions. I, you know, not to be rude about it, but <laughs> I, 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 I have not seen the country B torturing country A back... Uh, in these, you know, like what we're seeing right now since the fall of that city in country A slash country B. (laughs) Um, I didn't see that anywhere else. Uh, You know, maybe it's just the propaganda bubble that I'm in, but um, one side is definitely torturing and murdering prisoners of war while the other side is keeping them for a while and then releasing them. You know. Or, or I don't know, trying them, putting them in prison. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. There are a lot of. I mean, Russia they, has captured a lot of prisoners. They send a lot of Azov uh, guys home, already. and they they sometimes do yeah. prisoner exchanges, right? Well, the meanest thing they could do to a country would be to send the Azov battalion back to them. You know, that's. that's I think like they the, realize that. Yeah, let the punishment <laughs> fit the crime on that one. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, that's is a grim thought, but so. Do we have a, are we kind of clear about, you know, uh, aggression being the supreme international war crime? Well, yeah. And then all these others uh, where jurisdiction is in question and who will prosecute and all that, you know, we've got the International Criminal Court, we've got this and that, uh, and, and that becomes kind of uncertain. Now, in your opinion, was John McCain a war criminal at any point in his career? I think he was when he was a bomber pilot. Oh, but then after he became a legislator, even though he did infinitely more harm as a legislator, huh? Uh, I would say he would have immunity to prosecution, but I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, okay. And, you know, uh, there is precedent. I-, I believe that some Nazi legislature, legislators, they, they kept their <laughs> Bundestag. Uh-huh going really through the entire war you know they would you know i i don't know if they had any elections i don't think they did but if they did it would be like hmm. elections in in iraq under saddam hussein yeah uh but they they kept the uh the appearance of a parliamentary democracy in place through the entire war. Mm-hmm. We had all these legislators meeting and you know basically rubber stamping whatever Hitler wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if any of them were. No, yeah, uh, I'm looking. I'm indicted. looking right now. It, it says okay. So it says the International Military Tribunal, and they had questions about ex post facto law. Right. Which I don't think, I, I think that's solipsistic, to put it mildly. Like, of course these things weren't criminal when they did them. If you're, if you're talking about a war crimes, um, mm-hmm. generally, as a general rule, there's... Well, no, again, mm-hmm. the Geneva Conventions existed before. Yeah. And there was the League of Nations, there was the... 
Uh, there was a treaty in 1929 which outlawed all war. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't. That treaty did not stand up very well. No. Was it the kellogg Brian yes. pact? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it was, thank that you. One from high school. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, uh, I'm I'm looking at the list. I'm trying to find the list now of, of who was indicted and whether they indicted. Them. So a lot of what you're saying is coming from Nuremberg, though, right? And yes. The, okay. All right. Okay. So I need to read about that. Since that would be the big, um, that would be the biggest example. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so cabinet minister, like uh, cabinet ministers. Um, I we, think that's executive branch. Yep, They're, they they, are. Can, they can yep. be charged. Um, leaders of the German economy, like Gustav Krupp and the president of Reichsbank and a Albert Speer. Well, okay, yeah, not not legislatures, military leaders, propagandists. Um, Okay, here we go. The governor general of Poland seriously doubt he was elected. <laughs> you know, I don't know about yeah. much about how a, a, the, the Nazi general ended. of Poland sounds like, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, Hitler or, or one of his pals. Yeah, I'm thinking appointed more, this guy. More general than governor is what I'm thinking. Probably uh, yeah, not yeah. Well elected. Okay, not so not elected. No yeah, way. You're right. There's <laughs> there does not appear to be any legislatures legislators. In, yeah, I, I didn't huh. know. Um, I, I knew that if there were any, there would have been a f only a few. That's fascinating. So, um, so you can't get uh, Hillary Clinton and Senator Barack Obama, Senator Clinton. Mm -hmm. You can't get them on war crimes while they were senators. Mm -hmm. But then, when they, when they, when Clinton becomes Secretary of State, and yeah. Obama becomes the ch the president, the commander in chief of the mm -hmm. U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, then they they start committing war crimes right and left. Okay, so in a perfect world where where uh, politicians really do start, not just politicians, but where aggressors start uh, getting caught for war crimes mm -hmm. and going down, mm -hmm. what's to stop them from taking refuge in the legislature? What would stop a legislator well, from being a, a war criminal? You mean like getting a le if Obama ran for the uh, U.S. Senate again? Yeah, yeah, right, it, right now. Yeah, like let's say that or George, next, you know, in twenty twenty four doesn't even have to be that. I mean, <laughs> let's say it works for state house. I mean, why wouldn't it work for state house? <laughs> um, because he did it. In the past, and there's proof he boasted yeah. about it. You know, okay, but let's say these, let, these presidents. Yeah. Very little investigation is going to be needed if a president is ever yeah. Yeah. Um, hauled before a court for aggression. They yeah. boast about it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I, I murdered, um, I authorized that murder of uh, Soleimani, the Iranian mm -hmm. general. Yeah, he was uh, proud anti, of yeah. Anti-terrorist general. He was fighting ISIS yeah. for years. He it's was proud new, of it. They boast of their crimes. Yeah, it's a big new Brzezinski, you know. I, yeah. I like to think he realized his mistake at some point. But Maybe. I mean, for all the good that does. <laughs> right. Thanks. <laughs> doesn't <laughs> bring anyone back. Yeah, no, it doesn't. I've been wondering lately what would have happened. You know, I mean, like, the um, looking at it with what we know now, like, 9-11 was a straightforward military attack by the government of Saudi Arabia. I don't know. No, well, I mean no. They've it's mysterious to me. One of the uh, one of the hijackers was getting paid a monthly stipend by the Saudi government. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah that, you know. That's pretty pretty good evidence. Yeah. That's, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and I don't know if it's better that we didn't see that as a call call to war than that we did. But um, anyway, it's nice to think that someday um, something might happen to these people um, for everything they've done. But. <sighs> Well, if the United States does not stop overthrowing country, uh, governments, uh, sending weapons to yeah, groups, well, that's what we do. Yeah, if we don't stop that, uh, it's getting very close to the time when the rest of the world is going to say we've had enough of this. Yeah, we're not going to let this happen anymore. We're not going to take your dollars. We're not going to sell you anything. Yep. And they don't let us sell. Uh, we, we, we'll, we might buy American products, sure, if we need them. Mm -hmm. We might buy your products. We're not going to sell you anything. <laughs> if they uh, wanted to, if anybody wanted to hurt America, the single most harmful thing you could possibly do to America, short of nuclear war, of course, is um, 
you could take away our right and ability to sell weapons overseas. That would plunge America into the most nightmarish civil war you've ever seen. Well, I think refusing to take dollars and buy our treasury bonds would yeah. would be just as effective yeah. in stopping our crime spree. Well, I mean, uh, as long as we keep selling weapons to both sides, and that is just really what the world hates the most about us, is this we just keep finding the worst people we can and selling them weapons over and over and over again. Uh-huh. Um, if we can't do that anymore, we're going to be in a the same well, situation as um, the cartels in Mexico when they closed the border, because the the people at the top aren't reasonable about maintaining their profit stream. When they close the border, they tell the people that work for them, okay, well, you know, figure out a way to make that much money here, which is first off impossible. It was impossible for the cartels in Mexico. And it'll be impossible here. They can't co possibly keep up these inflated income streams if they only have Americans to sell to. And what they will need to, Americans to do in order to maintain their profits is for they'll need Americans to start attacking each other. You know, that's, that's that how could you happen. drive a business. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I guess has happened uh, near the Texas border with Mexico. Yeah. But uh, you mentioned the arms bazaar in Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, the free market may decide that American weapons are overpriced <laughs> and you know we'll only we'll pay you 10 percent and uh, and we'll take your weapons for 10 percent of the of the sticker price yeah that, uh, that is what I'm you, reading you, you'll have to be happy with that because we're not going to give you any more your weapons are no good you know the free market may solve some of that situation. Yeah, I've I've actually been reading that um similarly that in a lot of ways are are they're not mine. Um the weapons that America is making are underperforming in Ira in um Ukraine in a number of ways. Um, right. They're unreliable. Um they don't really work nearly as well as advertised. You know, yeah. Ukraine's lost their power grid because America's gave them missile defense systems that didn't really work. Um Right. Well, yeah. over the nine-month period from Fe the end of February to uh, now, uh, late November, yeah. uh, the nature of the war in Ukraine has changed. At first, it was a conflict, military conflict between Russia, and on their side were the um, Donbass, mm -hmm. Russian, ethnic Russian militias, so Russia and the militias, against the Ukrainian army, mm -hmm. uh, trained, supplied with NATO weapons. Yes. At a certain point, a couple months ago, yeah. uh, the Russian Minister of Defense, uh, Shoigu, announced publicly, we are no longer at war with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. We are at war with the collective West. And for some reason, that comment was not reported very widely. Well, they mostly deny it in this it. country. They mostly deny it. I think the uh, an EU spokesperson just very recently gave a um, was it the German uh, the German um, Chancellor of the EU? What's her name? Von de, von de Leyen or something like that. She said uh, one of her things is like, and we affirm that Ukraine and only at Ukraine, or that that Ukraine that Russia is not at war with the collective West. <laughs> like they said that specifically. Doesn't matter what she said. Yeah, no, she wasn't really fooling anybody. It matters what yeah. the de defense minister of Russia says. Yeah, and that one it sure does. And know. and what he meant was it's no longer it's no longer a war with Ukraine. Um, more and more mercenaries. Yeah. Uh, NATO trained mercenaries from all over the world, many different countries, yeah. are being uh, infiltrated into Ukraine, mm -hmm. and so we've got we've got the remnants of the Ukrainian army. We've got a bunch of mercenaries, and it's fundamentally a NATO force there yes. now. Yep. For the last few months. Yeah, it has been. And it's to the point where we're even admitting, I mean, we've had soldiers, America has had soldiers deployed in Ukraine the entire time, but now we're getting to the point where we admit it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that, that brings us back to something um, that you mentioned a while, or that we were talking about a while ago. 
um, which is the concept of the filibuster. Uh, and I want to get... Uh, <laughs> well, no, I mean, because it, 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 it goes into this directly, but I wanted a little more clarity on something. So, in your opinion, John McCain, even though he was, at the time, when he was a young man, carrying out orders... Yes. ...in um, bombing indiscriminately and just murdering enormous groups of people and animals and plants that he never knew, never cared about. Just killed and killed and killed and killed. Killed entire square miles, like personally. Square miles of humanity and mm -hmm. life are dead because John McCain was born. But that, that, he was following all, orders. Those were all war crimes. But he's following so, orders. So, look, the, the Nuremberg trials mm -hmm. themselves yeah. made it clear that I've, I was just following orders. Yeah. There's no excuse. Okay, but and, then, and they they hanged a number of people who were just following orders. Yeah. So in a just world, would uh, this is tough to say? I don't even I, I don't like to think about it because we like to give American soldiers a pass and say like you know you didn't you were just following orders. But um, would you say that fair war crime tribunals would put a per, a large percentage of the American military in jail? I would not. Yeah. Um. Even at Nuremberg, they didn't try every single yeah. German they had in prison. They they looked For the first leaders, yeah. at, at the top ones, mm -hmm. the ones most responsible, the ones who the decision makers. They focused on them, and they were the ones who got hanged. Yeah, um, a whole lot of lower level officers, uh, you know. Um, may have been in prison for a while. Uh, I don't know what happened to them, but they, they weren't hanged. So, but basically, if there's ever war crimes tribunals... It should focus on the top. Yeah, and it's just going to be catch as catch can. We're just going to do as best we can with the law we've got versus the existing power structures. There's not going to be... Well, yeah. there'll have to be a new power structure in this country yeah. to allow a president or a former president or a former secretary of defense to be tried yeah. for war crimes. The whole power structure will have to be inverted or upset yeah. significantly. It, we, I don't see it in our present, you know, with our present Congress. No. <laughs> Well, I mean, that are balanced, you know, between Republicans and Democrats. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really <laughs> afraid of what it's going to take America to start acting more sanely. Defeat. Yeah. Right? I think it's economic collapse yeah. and, and military defeat mm. or, you know, the inability to resupply and pay our soldiers. We may oh, have yeah. to bring them home because they won't, they'll starve if we don't. Yeah. Something like that. Then, I mean, we have the same problem. Like, we have a thoroughly violentized, and we use a lot of mercenaries in our military. Um, right. You know, I, some I of them are called contractors. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, okay, so filibuster. Now, we, we talk about filibuster these days as the um, somebody, like an arcane um, uh, electoral technique that has a lot of precedent, that it has a lot of power right now because of the way things are. But filibuster in the original sense, in the American sense, is a group of people who get together on their own and go try to invade another country for America, and if they can take it over, they try to turn it into a state or turn it over to America. And well, this, this happened this a lot. like what time period, like late 1700s? Or? Oh, 1800, 1900. This happened all the way through. Technically, Bay of Pigs was a filibuster. William Walker's, I have no idea. Yeah, William Walker's <laughs> attempt to take over Nicaragua in 1857 was a filibuster. Mm. Um, there were people called the Sons of the Golden Eagle who wanted to take over Canada, Mm. and ordered some really, really, really fancy swords to do it <laughs> and never got around to taking over Canada. So they, um, the swords were purchased by um, a sheep farmer named John Brown who ended up uh, using them to uh, kill slave owners. Uh, John Brown was technically a filibuster. Uh, a lot of people invaded C Cuba over the years. Um, right. You know, it wasn't just the Bay of Pigs. That's one of the reasons why Cuba was so god gosh darn sick of Americans sending little groups of people to go try to take over. There was a filibuster attempt under Trump. I forget what nation it was. It um, Venezuela, where a bunch of just absolute nincompoops got in a speedboat and tried to go take oh, over? Yeah, Americans got yeah. in the speedboat, and, and I think uh, Nicaraguan 
fishermen. Yeah. Stop them. Yeah, just because that's and a captured them all. That, that's a <laughs> pathetic echo of of what used to be honestly right. very dangerous. Mexico was filibustered a number of times. The Texas Revolution could be considered a, the most successful filibuster of all time. Anyway, right, so I've never heard that word used yeah. for that particular action. Well, not only not only is it. Um, not only is it an accepted American tradition um, and the foundation of our, our ownership of many, um, you know, the reason why Texas is uh, American instead of Mexico is because of uh, filibusters. Um, and, and like I said, it continues to this day. Like the, the people that invaded Venezuela in the jet boat, um, I'm sure whichever ones made it back to America faced no long-term negative effects whatsoever. Um, yeah, maybe not. Yeah, it's not against the law. It's not against the law to invade another country if you're an American. It seems to me it would be a violation of the Logan Act. I, yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> of course, only two people have ever been tried for the Logan Act, or even indicted for the Logan Act, and um, both cases it was dropped. But yeah, that does sound nice, yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's nice to think that America could rein in our... Um, Mercenaries. Yeah, we do not view our mercenaries with sufficient suspicion in this country. Or contempt. Yeah, well, um, we were talking about this a while ago, but I, if you recall, I found that Russian law that I found very interesting, where in Russia it is against the law to adopt a child or teach a school, teach at school if you are or have ever have been a Nazi or a mercenary. Interesting. Yeah. And in Russian law, it's just very interesting that um, Nazis and mercenaries are, are afforded the same respect under Russian law, Russian law being notably anti-Nazi. In yeah. Well, let me, um, let me raise a question that some of my liberal friends might ask. What yeah. about the, the Wagner, Wagner group yeah, in that's, Russia? That is part aren't, of what's so aren't interesting. Aren't they mercenary or what are they? Who are they? I don't well, know what they are. The Wagner group is interesting. I mean, they do exist. Um, they fought in Syria and then they um, the, the story with the Wagner group is always the leader of the Wagner group what is a Nazi and that's why they're called the Wagner group. Because, no. Yeah, they're named it after. can't be. Well, I mean, that can't be true. The, the Wagner group fights on behalf of Russia, right? Yeah. They, they usually do what the Russian military yeah. and want them to do. They can't be Nazis. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, but this is the story. The story oh, is this is the, the story. Okay. The story is the leader of the Wagner group is a Nazi. And there's, this, <laughs> there's two or three pictures of him that are shown millions and millions of times. And, I mean, and, and there's like, he's, you know, he's na they're named the Wagner group because they're named after Wagner, <laughs> Hitler's favorite composer. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the Ukrainian militia that just took over Kherson is walking around with a flag that says Fertwangler on it. Says what? Fertwangler. What's that mean? Well, Americans don't really know about this stuff because we don't really care too much. Like, but Wagner wasn't Hitler's favorite composer. Wagner had been dead for for decades when Hitler came on the scene. <laughs> ha, Wagner, uh, Hitler's favorite composer composer was a fellow named Wilhelm Furtwangler, Furtwangler who was a active. I mean, uh, he was active in in the Third Reich. Like okay. he was actively conducting and playing th during the Third Reich. And I mean, although there's um, moral complexities to the guy that you know you don't find with, I guess the rest of his crew. Like the, these folks named themselves after, you know, after his actual favorite composer, as if they were saying, "You all aren't real fans of Hitler." <laughs> like, yeah, we, you, you got it wrong. Yeah, yeah. But the, but so going back to the Wagner Group, what, yeah, what is it? The Wagner Group is supposed to be a a shadowy group of Russian mercenaries. Uh huh. And they have they were there are convincing reports that they were on the battlefield in Syria in 2014 mm -hmm. and then not much until recently where they have been put into they've been part of the general Russian militia or uh, mercenary front because yeah they, well they yeah. have a unified command now yeah so all of these people yeah are under one commander and they are official Russian soldiers yeah because when Russia put the um put the uh, draft on then they changed this over to what was it not as, before it was a special military operation and now it, or something different now it might be called a war i don't know yeah well i don't think they're calling it a war yet because All right. you know the russians really enjoy using the same nonsensical excuses we do <laughs> that's a big big thing hey i'm going to play the talk show disclaimer again real fast because now we're really heavy into the controversial stuff 
The following program contains views, ideas, and opinions that have been produced by the host DJ and their guests, and are not reflective of the views of WRFL or its underwriters. For questions, comments, or concerns, please email programming at wrfl.fm. A decorated general with a heart of gold that likened him to all the stories he told of past battles won and lost and legends of old. A seasoned veteran in his own time, on the battlefield he gained respectful fame with many medals of bravery and stripes to his name. He grew a beard as soon as he could to cover the scars on his face and always urged his men on. But on the eve of a great battle with the infantry and dream, the old general tossed in his sleep and lesser with its meaning. He awoke from the night to tell what he had seen. And walked slowly out of his tent All the men held tall with their chests in the air With the courage in their blood and a fire in their stare And it was a great morning and they all wondered how they would fare To the old general told them to go home He said I have seen the others And I have discovered That this fight is not worth fighting And I've seen their mothers And I will know Follow me where I'm going So Take a shower and shine your shoes You got no time to lose If you are young men you must be living Take a shower and shine your shoes You got no time to lose If you are young men you must be living Go now you are forgiven But the men stood fast with their guns on their shoulders Not knowing what to do with the contradicting orders The general said he would do his own duty But he extended no further The men could go as they pleased But not a man moved Their eyes gazed straight ahead Till one by one they stepped back And not a word was said And the old general was left with his own words Echoing in his head He then prepared to fight He said I have seen the others And I have discovered That this fight is not worth fighting no, and I've seen their mothers, and I will no other to follow me where I'm going. So, take a shower and shine your shoes. Oh, you got no time to lose. You are young men, you must be living. Yeah, take a shower and shine your shoes. Oh, you got no time to lose. You are young men, you must be living. Go now, you are forgiven Welcome to 88.1 WRFL, all the way to the left. And again, our telephone number is 859-257-WRFL. Thank you so much for everybody who uh, called in, who has been uh, listening along on Twitter or the internet, whatever. Uh, and again, this is Radio Free Eskipa Kafiki, and that song you just heard was uh, 
the general by dispatch. Uh, it's a sort of lovely thought. So I'm here with, this is Jeff's best, and I'm here with Jeff Young, and we are working through um, the logistics of war crimes and how to know when your friends are war criminals. <laughs> Or your favorite politician. Yeah, your favorite. Well, we all have our favorite war criminals for politicians. Mine's Jimmy Carter. Yours is apparently Ron DeSantis right now. No, Jimmy Carter, yeah. Mm. He's mine, too. Now, you said that DeSantis is, um, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm intrigued by your Democrats for DeSantis idea because it's... Um, yeah, can we talk about something else? <laughs> oh God, because that that just that that one turned into a much bigger thing than I was supposed to. But no, I mean, that's the, that's the thing is like people need um, All right. some I'll, kind of clarity. I can explain it very quickly. Yeah, uh, Democrats for DeSantis. W what it means is uh, anyone but Trump, and uh, hopefully anyone but Biden, because he's a war criminal too, a yeah. major one, an aggressor. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, my worst case scenario, personally, is in 2024, the uh, interminable primary process goes on, mm -hmm. and at the end of it, out comes, I don't know, 80-year-old Joe Biden, war criminal, and yeah. uh, whatever year old Trump, war criminal, from his four years in power, two war criminals facing each other. And third parties, you know, never win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my nightmare. That's yeah. that's why I started a little, you know, a group on social media. It's <laughs> a, the only place it exists at the moment, called Democrats for DeSantis. Just just anybody but Trump. Yeah, no, I'm I'm glad you did actually because so much interesting conversation came <laughs> out of such a strange thing. I mean, it was not <laughs> something that anybody realized, and um, I found that most of the most of the conversation on the internet over it is um, over whether or not Ron DeSantis is a war criminal. Right. Whereas I think the average Kentucky voter, when they hear Ron DeSantis, thinks about COVID. But um, Yeah. Well, but we're not going to talk about COVID because no. you've got the entire election season to talk about COVID. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last time we're going to get to talk about foreign policy for a while, so I want to use it. So um, <laughs> Ron DeSantis um, was a legislator. No, Ron DeSantis was a lawyer at Abu Ghraib where he defended um, things like extraordinary rendition and other fancy legalists. He, his, he was in charge of coming up with legal terms for torture and kidnapping. Okay. But I, I agree with you there that the lawyer for a war criminal is not there for a war criminal. No, a I, lawyer, I, yeah. I wouldn't agree. You think, a lawyer, you think the lawyer for a war criminal can also be a war criminal? Well... Uh, what was his office? I mean, wh what rank was he? I mean, that's a good question. Uh, he was like the head of the uh, legal team at Abu Ghraib, mm -hmm. if, if I if I'm correct about that. I believe so. Yeah. So the, re the <laughs> in a sane world, in a just world, the head of the legal team at Abu Ghraib should have been saying. Uh, to the, you know, to his superior officer all the way up to the Secretary of Defense. Yeah. There's things going on here that should not be going on. Um, if this doesn't stop, you know, it's the CIA doing it. The FBI is not doing it quite as much. If this doesn't stop, I'm going public and, uh, does a lawyer you, have a responsibility you, to do that? When you'll, they have a if, you'll have to fire me. If no, have, we're talking about war crimes. Okay, but if you're, if you're a lawyer and yeah. you have a client who refuses to stop committing crimes, uh -huh. um, you ha do you have a legal, or, or, yeah, a legal or an ethical responsibility to bring them to justice? No. So even though these people were doing you know, the crime he, that contains all other crimes... He was not their lawyer. He, DeSantis, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm making a lot of assumptions here. I don't really know what he did, but he was not he was the, representing yeah. the accused torturers. Yes, he was at any time. Yeah, he was directly actually. He was directly representing. Them. I mean, if they had if they had gone to court, then he would have been the one to represent them. As that at the time, there was none of none of. Right. Actually, well, you know, look, wait, look again. What do you have his title? 
Uh, no. It says he worked for the commander of Joint Task Force Guantanamo, working directly with detainees at the Guantanamo Bay Joint Detention Facility. So he should have been talking to this commander mm -hmm. every day saying, "We this is not legal. Yeah. We can't torture people. No matter who who is doing it, CIA, FBI, whoever, we can't torture prisoners. Uh, so w the torture programs at Abu at, Ghraib were war crimes, correct? Yeah. And Guantanamo. Those were yeah, war crimes. Yes. So... It just, you know, I mean, we're, I know we're just like sort of uh, guessing here, but do you think that since he was the legal representation for people that committed some of the worst war crimes of this century, he is therefore a war criminal? So that's a long sentence. And the first clause is since he was, re he, he had been ordered to represent these suspects, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But that was not his only function. Yeah. His function as an officer, I mean, the, the legal head is, is, is also an officer of the United States military, is part of his legal responsibility is to inform his superior officers uh -huh. when something, when a crime is being committed by those officers themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. I see what you're saying here. He, he's more than one role. It's not like yeah. he, they have another DeSantis uh, representing the prosecution. Yeah. Okay, so is that why you make the distinction between him being a minor war criminal and a major war criminal? Yeah, the major war crimes are aggression. Yeah. Okay, so, so far, you know, and of course we got to come back around to McGrath eventually, but McCain <laughs> and, well, McCain in his capacity as a bomber, and DeSantis in his capacity as a lawyer for torturers, mm -hmm. and um, McGrath in her military capacity mm -hmm. would be minor war criminals, correct? That would be my opinion as a non-attorney. Now, when McGrath um, graduated to actually advocating for war in the Pentagon, as um, that's, that's when you think she graduated to major mi war criminal, or do you think she's just a minor war criminal all the way through? All the way through. Okay, so yeah. She was not deciding, should we invade Iraq or not? Okay, yeah. Uh, should we keep our troops there or withdraw? That was above her pay grade. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, and as I've said before, I like the idea of doing a mailing for Ron DeSantis that says, vote for Ron DeSantis, he's the only candidate that's not a major war criminal yet. Yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> and then just make the rest of the mailing a description of what war crimes are. <laughs> You know, that works for me. Okay, so um, yeah, that that really answers most of my major questions. Um, I'll be darned. Well, I mean, we the 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 one that never got really answered when we did the show with Mike and Chris was if McGrath, how can McGrath be a war criminal and Putin isn't? And I think oh. Well, I think the first off, I think the distinction between minor and major war criminal helps a lot there. Okay. And second, um, I, I do understand the legal justification that you're talking about, where Donetsk and Luhansk and the other the other republics had the legal right to to be independent, and Ukraine was unambiguously attacking them. You know, no one in there, I shouldn't right. say right, but nobody with the slightest awareness of what was happening over there denies that UK, Ukraine was openly attacking Donetsk and Luhansk. Yeah, for eight years, from yeah. 2014 to 2022. Yeah, just and, randomly and shelling. And they still are today. It, I mean, literally but, just randomly shelling, to right? To me, that yeah. is the core of the issue. Mm -hmm. yep. um, are the Russians... Uh, is Putin himself a madman, uh, an aggressor, <laughs> uh, a guy who d woke up one day and said, yeah, send in the tanks? Yeah. Um, he unprovoked. He pressed the tanks button with his elbow. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, were the aggressors, the Ukrainian military, the, uh, the Nazi militias, their yeah. handlers in the CIA and the Pentagon— NATO, egging them on to keep fighting. Who are the aggressors here? I think that's, to me, the most important issue of this entire yeah, discussion. Yeah. Who are the aggressors? And I've been researching it hard for the last nine months. Mm -hmm. 
uh, there was a great article published in Covert Action magazine mm -hmm. by um, a careful analyst of foreign affairs named Roger Annis, A-N-N-I-S. Mm -hmm. uh, he built on previous work by Daniel Kovalik and probably uh, work by other, you know, people in other countries. Mm -hmm. We don't have the only, you know, lawyers, international law people in the world. Yeah. There are plenty of others. Uh, and Roger Annis demonstrated to me that uh, Russia was acting in self-defense and thereby uh, its special military operation from February 22nd till today has been covered, has been justified by Article 51, yeah. Article 51 of the UN Charter, which, which allows for the use of force in self-defense and collective self-defense. Yeah. Self-defense would refer to Russia itself being threatened by, you know, possible NATO missiles, by, by shelling across the yeah. Ukrainian border. Collective self-defense, the ethnic Russians in Donetsk and Lugansk and other places throughout Ukraine were being attacked mm -hmm. for eight years. Yeah, and I mean, well, and, uh, to me, the, the crux of it is that these were independent republics under the Minsk agreements, and they had the right... No, they weren't. Uh, they, they were supposed to get autonomy. Yeah, but they didn't... Yeah, because... Uh, but No, they had, uh, they had autonomy under the agreements. Just because Ukraine didn't honor the agreements doesn't mean the agreements were never made. They had the they right... They had autonomy. That's yeah. not independence. Though. Okay, I'm sorry. They had autonomy. But... Um, and they had a ceasefire, and they had yeah. commitments by France and Germany and to actually, to get the government of Ukraine to to follow what they had signed in Minsk one and two. And, and you know, I, um, um, something that I hope you can clear up for me because it always confused me. When they say they were shelling them, mm -hmm. they were that that's literally all they were doing. They were just sitting on the other side of the river shooting artillery randomly. No, they're the, snipers too. So they were just randomly killing people. They were attacking those areas. Yeah, that had. Yeah. I mean, the areas uh, uh, declared themselves independent of Kiev. Yeah. Long ago, but Russia never Refused recognized to recognize it them until, until recently, yeah. like February 2022. Yeah, they they finally recognized them. Yeah, actually, this was not a decision by Vladimir Putin, but by the Soviet Duma, the Duma, legislature, yeah. and they kind of made Putin recognize these two republics as independent and then immediately the two republics said great thanks uh yeah. we need help yeah <laughs> we're being attacked there's a huge army setting up right across the border mm -hmm. all of their best troops their best weapons yeah and they're getting ready to wipe us out help us you know and it's the, the one of the um we're inside the american we're very much inside the american version of things here but it always struck me how people never put two and two together it's like you know like yeah most of you most of ukraine's army is in the east mm -hmm. like yeah <laughs> most of ukraine's army was in the east the best part yeah of it. yeah that's why they were in the east they were getting ready to attack they right. were already attacking and they were right. getting ready to do worse and, exactly you know it just in order to deny it it you, you have to um really delve into solipsism well like, you have to start talking about russian propaganda yeah like the usa Putin today puppets. is yeah the usa today's article on the azov battalion being made up of nazis in 2014 was a, a the Kremlin. The Kremlin made them do it. <laughs> you know, it's like there's there's so much, there's just so much information here. It's really a testament to people's ability to ignore it because this was so well known. It's a, it's, it's a little bit upsetting even to this day that so many people have managed to absolutely forget. Like mm -hmm. in, in many cases, they must have known and just decided to forget or recontextualize or that they shouldn't talk about it. Yeah, I'm kind of interested in the Israeli lobby yeah. in this country. How so? Uh, uh, Kufi, mm -hmm. Christians United for Israel, and mm -hmm. APAC. Everybody's heard of the American Israel yeah. Public Affairs Committee. 
Um, it seems to me that they have been supporting U.S. military aid, training, uh, and, and weapons and, and money going to uh, the Kiev government for the last, you know, for several years. Yes, please continue. I'm going to get grabbed. Several. That one. It's it's uh, kind of odd to me that um, lobbying groups that profess their desire to uh, keep Israel safe from attack, uh, keep the well APAC. Uh, defend the Jewish people against anti-Semitism anywhere in the world, uh, would be supporting the funding of Nazis for years. Yeah. And I can't get them to, to admit it, of course. Yeah. You know, I, on Twitter, I, I, keep, I ask them every so often, you know, uh, isn't there something wrong with your leadership that you've been, yeah. <laughs> you've been funding Nazi? I mean, these are the same ideology, not the same individual, the same ideology mm -hmm. that perpetrated the Holocaust, and you're helping them. Why? Yeah, because um, because a lot of people sincerely believe the enemy of their enemy is their friend, and they're wrong, and a lot of people just don't care what happens as long as they make a buck, and uh, that's that's the weapons dealers of the world. Right. You know, they, they just don't give a damn. Um, I suppose it's worth mentioning at this point that both you and I are of Jewish descent. I think you of more Jewish descent than I, but, um, you know, we're extremely upset about Israel and how Israel's behaved. Like, I, I consider it, I don't take it personally anymore because, you know, greater historical disasters have happened since I was uh, younger, but I, I, I feel very betrayed by the way that Israel's dream of peace has turned into an absolute nightmare. Yeah, and I think it's mainly uh, the U.S. is the dog and Israel is the tail. Yeah. I don't buy the theories that somehow Israel and, you know, the Jews yeah. <laughs> run America. It seems like if I they did, they would it. tell us. <laughs> it's like we'd well, be invited to the softball game at least, right? But no, there's no such, no such that we know of. Um, yeah, that, and that's I, th I feel that the people of Israel uh, are taking advantage of our good name and of the historical sympathy that accrued to us in some very nightmarish ways. Um, you know, it, it really makes me speculate about how, um, as, as disappointed as I am in Jon Stewart lately, he did say something interesting the other day. He said, hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And the way that the way that Israel has transformed into the image of everything that they were meant to be against is, I think, very interesting, very sad. Well, if the Israeli lobby in this country didn't exist, yeah. Israel might have a little more freedom of action to uh, yeah. to just get along with their neighbors, to treat the Palestinians yeah. like people, to implement the two-state solution. Yeah. That might require some instead we are talking as we, to by Russia. But we always and instead what we do is we find the worst people we can and give them a lot of weapons. The yeah. hard the hardest line, the most ruthless. Yeah. We always do it. And I mean that's like I think that is a fair criticism of the United States. Yeah. I, I don't, well it's how empires work. No, you know, Rome, Rome would like march right in and take a place over. You know, most places yeah, but, militarily occupy the places that they conquer. We okay. never even sent a soldier into Libya. We just bombed them back to the Stone Age and then left. That's true. You know, we, we have no interest in invading. We don't want to send soldiers to Taiwan. We want a you know, we want a nice fancy military base there, sure. But, you know, we don't want to declare martial law in Taiwan. We want well, Taiwan to have a nice little war that we can sell weapons for. The underlying impulse is control. Yeah. The U.S. wants to control as many countries in the world as possible. Mm -hmm. And the trend has been the opposite direction lately. Yeah. Past couple of years, uh, fewer and fewer allies 
And now I think a lot of people in Europe, especially regular people, are realizing that uh, the United States is not really... <laughs> not really on Ukraine's side. <laughs> on, on the side of Germany, of our supposed allies. It does, we don't... The, the U.S., um, mm -hmm. Washington, doesn't really care a whole lot about the people of France and Britain. Yeah. Uh, we're asking them to boycott or, or you know, economic sanctions against freeze to Russia. Death. Freeze and starve to death. And, yeah, and they're not happy about it, and they're making that known to their governments. And, yeah. I, I, you know, already, what have we had? Uh, two two uh, prime ministers of <laughs> Britain fired. Yeah. We've had Italy fire there. Prime Minister, who else? But I, I see a lot of these countries, you know, a lot of these governments mm -hmm. in the EU um, on a very unsteady ground. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't pretend to understand European politics, <laughs> but um, I do pay close attention to it, and it seems to me that people in Europe are extremely upset. Yes. Um, don't really want anything to do with this. With a, with good reason. Yeah, and we. So I want to mention yeah. just one other okay. detail. Uh, yeah. A few days ago, I, I saw a headline that the uh, the EU Parliament had come together and met and voted to uh, declare that Russia mm -hmm. is a state sponsor of terrorism. Yeah. How's that going to lead to a negotiated? Agreement. Well, I mean, that's the thing is... If that, you start calling people murderers yeah. and terrorists, you know, that, that's kind of... They don't want an agreement. Zelensky specifically, no, personally... He, no, yeah, he uh, doesn't. ...stopped agreements, uh, and I don't understand his reasoning. I don't respect his reasoning. I've lost all respect for v Volodymyr Zelensky. After that thing in Poland... I'd lost it before, but mm -hmm. after that thing where they bombed Poland and tried to start <laughs> World War Three. Like, I was just like, to hell with this guy. I'm completely done with this freaking dude asking for money. And like, he's just like the world's most violent beggar. I, most, I, I don't know of the people who are listening to this, but Poland is not that close to Russia. And it's the other way. <laughs> you know, the missiles that they were shooting <laughs> oh. went really far in the wrong direction and killed innocent people. They killed just two dudes in Poland who worked at a at a grain silo, just murdered them. Um and there's really not a lot of logical once you once you've internalized the fact that these missiles have an operational range that will not get them to Russian territory and the Russians could not have fired the missile that far and they knew that from the very beginning. You know, America tracks every missile fired. Either Zelensky knows who his, his group is, either Zelensky knows who his military is shooting uh, missiles at, or he doesn't, and neither answer is acceptable. <laughs> so there's no, there's no excuse here for how a missile killed innocent people in Poland, and Americans don't understand, you know, because we were not intimately connected to these places. Poland is in the other direction, <laughs> really far. They knew from the very first moment that that was not a Russian missile. And they chose to lie about it and to bring the world probably as close to World War III as it's ever come. Mm. You know, there's people say 1983 or 1962, but I think when we go back and we look at it, um, they, they actively start, tried to... Yeah, yeah, the media, the Western mass media was uh, mm -hmm. shameless in, in reporting unverified, day, unverified reports instantly. It's like they couldn't wait. They couldn't wait a few hours or, or maybe, you know, a whole day no. before reporting this. And to report just an obvious impossibility. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, to to just look it out, look at uh, look into it, check with some yeah. people, check with some experts who know the range of the missile. Yeah, uh, uh, they they couldn't wait. They reported it instantly. I think this was AP mm -hmm. and Reuters. And, and in, in fairness, the AP reporter who reported it first was um, fired. 
but he was reporting a um, all he was reporting was what a senior intelligence officer, a senior intelligence official, told him. Yeah. Well, so that person's neither been named nor fired. <laughs> right. Uh, the reporter lost their job. That's nice. Well, uh, it's it's irresponsible. Yeah. I mean, why, why why can't these why can't these sources give their names? I, World War Three is irresponsible. Uh, yeah, and you just like why why does why do reporters? Uh, you won't give your name. Forget it. We're well, not quoting you. You know, maybe that will be one nice thing that comes out of this is that reporters will sort of take a step back on start this. practicing journalism. Yeah, and you know what else I'd like to see out of this. Um, I think that this crisis has revealed what actual, what value actual leadership has, what value leaders have in a crisis. And I would like to see after this people look at actors like Zelensky and just pure figureheads like Biden and say, mm-hmm. these people are not sufficient. Mm-hmm. The, I, I'm, some of my best friends are actors. You know, I love actors, but <laughs> actors are not... Uh, being a famous actor is not a good qualification to be a politician. In fact, I'm starting to think it's the exact opposite. Because the worst president, you know, we talk about war criminals, but the worst president we've had in my lifetime was an actor. <laughs> and the guy that we have right now isn't really much more than an actor. He's not in any way in charge. Right. Yeah, his job is not falling off of bicycles. Let's see. Yeah, I had a thought about leaders. Um, Are you former? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, Former Prime Minister of Britain, Boris Johnson. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, When when he was Prime Minister, he went to Kiev, took a plane, and uh, we we now know that he was urging Zelensky not to negotiate a ceasefire. Yeah. And he convinced him. A few few months ago. He, he was it's as I understand it, the story is Boris Johnson is the one that convinced Zelensky to not negotiate. Yeah, well how he's kept convinced to this day I don't know. Well but. I've heard or read that uh Zelensky is surrounded by his film crew and CIA people. Yeah. I can believe it. Um, and Nazis. And the echo chamber. Yeah, literal Nazis. And people get angry when you point out that they're literal Nazis that the and you know people don't want to believe it because they feel bad that they supported Nazis because they didn't mean to. They want to be on the right side. You know, the television told them that this was a good safe thing to get upset about, that America had nothing to do with it, that our hands were clean and that we were just standing up for truth and justice. And freedom and democracy. Yeah, and <laughs> that look how that's turned out. Um, you know, this whole thing, obviously life is a process of learning, but this and then Iran have made me really fundamentally rethink the way that America talks about the news Mm -hmm. because we're in this situation now with Iran where as far as I can tell what's happening in Iran is terrible and I, I want to help them, but I'm also painfully aware that, um, our position, our relationship to the crisis in Iran right now is like a killer cop who's sitting at home, drunk off his butt, and he hears a call come over the radio. And he's trying to decide, yeah, well, you know, I did I did shoot their dog, but I, I wonder if I should go over there and help. No, <laughs> we should not. We should not get involved in Iran. We have hurt Iran so terribly and the people of Iran so terribly that anything we do over there that has our name anywhere near it will provoke a negative reaction that will make things infinitely worse. The, right. the worst people in Iran are begging for us to invade on both sides, both our allies and our opponents, because they know that if we invade or if we start sending serious military support, that they'll turn, we'll turn the nation into... Patriots. Yeah. <laughs> Iranian patriots again. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what will happen. Everybody will just, you know, they'll start saluting the flag and Iran will be the 51st state and everything will be fine. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll be demonstrating for Iranian independence. Yeah. But, um, from the U.S. So even though what's... Yeah, ha- I, don't, I don't know what's going on in Iran. But yeah, because we can't trust... I yeah. suspect that it's a color revolution. Yeah. And we have to suspect that. We have, we have a moral responsibility. You know, we're, we're like 
the owners, of, as Americans, we're like the owners of a Biden dog. We have the moral responsibility to suspect at all times that our dog might bite. Mm-hmm. And that, or in our case, that our government might lie us into yet another war. Right. And uh, if we don't do that, we are failing in our responsibility as Americans. And the reason I'm so worried about this now is that I've, I've, I've noticed that American military force is a loose cannon that uses American liberal aesthetics as the trigger. We read something that's happening in the world in the news that goes, and we go, oh, that's terrible. Somebody ought to do something. And as it happens, you know, the the single finger of the monkey's paw curls because the worst people in the world are sitting there listening to America waiting for us to say, oh, somebody should do something. Because then they jump in with like, oh, well, then we should definitely, you know, sell them a bunch of weapons and invade. And by the way, don't pay attention anymore. We've got it taken care of. <laughs> and they, they take advantage of our short attention span. The, the most brutal example is Afghanistan. Um, you know, I, I worked at the World Trade Center. I was very politically active when I worked at the World Trade Center. And one of the things we were all very upset about was the Taliban. Not because the Taliban was shutting down um, poppy fields. We thought that we knew about that, but we just thought that was weird and confusing. But no, the Taliban was blowing up statues and it was abusing women. And we didn't like that at all. And then September 11th happened and it just so happened that Afghanistan was on the top of the pile. Mm -hmm. They were just, they were the one, the nation, with the atrocity that we best remembered that was still in the public conscience that could theoretically be connected to you know the ta- to 9/11 in some way and they never had a damn thing to do with it not a single thing the, the fact Taliban? that yeah um, no, but, yeah but, osama bin laden osama was osama bin laden and his group were in afghanistan at yeah, the time not right? at the time no, no they were in afghanistan under when clinton was president Oh, they had already left? They were long gone. I mean, <laughs> okay. the, the theory is he's in Pakistan. I mean, where Osama bin Laden was is not, not well known to me. <laughs> but the point is that Afghanistan was only tangentially related, and it was only because they couldn't figure out how to... You know, remember how hard they tried to connect it to Iraq? Yes. But what happened was America, the worst people in America, when the September 11th happened, when the World Trade Center and the Pentagon was attacked, they understood that they got one free war. Mm-hmm. And the world wasn't going to stop them. And right. Afghanistan was on the top of the pile. And it was on top of the pile because it had offended the liberal aesthetic most recently. Uh, so they got hit harder than they normally would have. But it's the same thing with Iran. I, we desperately want to support women's rights in Iran. I, I do, don't you? Um, uh, I want women to have the rights that they had before we imposed before the Shah in the 70s, you know, I, I want women to have equal rights in Iran. That sounds great to me. Um, I'm not going to say at this moment uh, anything about women's rights in Iran because it's... because the propaganda is so thick here. Mm-hmm. I have yeah. read articles that suggest that the, the women's rights issue is being used as a kind of cover story What's actually going on is a color revolution where yeah. the uh, usual suspects, the CIA and everybody, are funding violent rebels yeah. in Iran to attack pol- Iranian police. Mm-hmm. That's what I've read. And so we don't I, know I, how I, much I, is... I, yeah. I don't know if it's true, but it sounds plausible. And we are, we are so painfully aware of our nation's legacy of blood that we consider it dangerous. You know, we're like, we're like the people that own a Biden dog. You know, it's, it is, even though it seems like a good reason, even though they're try even though it seems to make some sense, we have to be so careful and it is dangerous. Even it, it is literally dangerous to express an opinion about Iran, not to us, but to the people of Iran. We can get people in Iran killed by being incautious here. You know, we can hurt way more than we help. We've done it before. So uh, there, there's a good uh, professor, Morandi, mm-hmm. who's often on social media. Uh, he's, I don't think he's a, an employee of the Iranian military or government. I think he's a professor at Tehran University. And he has really good comments you know the mm-hmm. western media reporters interview him all the time 
uh, don't remember his first name, but um, he's good. I mean, yeah. you, you, at least listen to what he's saying before you decide we've got to do something. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is like when America says we've got to do something, what we really means is go ahead and do something. We'll stop paying attention. Because, I mean, where did the Afghanistan war end? with us pretending to care about Afghani women, exactly where it started. Yes. <laughs> After 20 years of doing absolutely nothing for them at all, and in fact making their life immeasurably worse in every way, and then leaving them to starve to death to warlords that we had given weapons to, um, we did absolutely nothing for Afghani women well, that I'm aware of. I, I know a, uh, a person in Lexington... Mm-hmm. Um, who who worked for the State Department for a long time, mm -hmm. and um, they needed people to go to Afghanistan to help set up schools for women. Yeah. And so she volunteered to go and uh, was there for a number of years and helped set up a number of schools and got, you know, she was engaged in discussions with the local leader, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was the mayor or a warlord or both at the same, in the same person. Yeah. Uh, and she was doing, uh, she, it was, uh, she has courage. She was uh, yeah. going into situations where she was not safe and trying to get some schools built. That's Problem heroic. is, yeah. uh, uh, they might get built, or they might not. They might get half built, yeah. and then you know, one one guy with a with a weapon can blow it up, and, yeah. or they or the army, you know, some you know, the Taliban can come along and use it for something else. Just a middle aged guy and a ba having a bad day. I mean, it, it's that's expressed differently, but that's a true human uh, constant. You know, so, people come up with excuses, but that's really what it is. She was there helping Afghan women, mm -hmm. but none of it could last. Yeah. It was being imposed upon them by the invaders. She mm. was working with and working for the invading force. Yeah. In the end. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, and so that is that is similar to Iran. Like, what is, it's a legal term, but the fruit of the poison tree. There's nothing we can do in Iran that isn't undone by the things we've already done. And if we want to help Iran, we have to think of another way to do it. Than yeah, just we've get tried. away. Get out of there. Yeah. Stop trying to make yeah. things, be make Iran great again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is that? MEGA? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you made me wonder about the MEK again, but I guess the MEK is, they they are the, um, they're probably who we're funding. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Here we, oh, actually, they are. Yeah. We, in 2004, the U.S. designated MEK protected persons under the Geneva Convention. Yeah. Okay. So the MEK is probably. That's a terrorist group. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. I think they're. Iranians. Yeah, they're Iranian. And they're, 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 they um, operated out of Iraq for years while mm -hmm. while the Iraq Iran war was going on. They're terrorists. Yeah, they're they're essentially a uh, they're trying to be a government in exile. Right. Did you hear that noise? Talk mm -hmm. about that for a second while I go figure out what that noise is. All right. So. Um. Where to begin here? Let's get back to the United States and war criminals. So I've thought about this a lot. This is uh, Jeff Young again. Um, if it's true that every U.S. president since 1945 has been an aggressor, has been a war criminal, there's something wrong with our system at the top. You know, I, I, I sometimes say the, the purpose of the Secretary of State, the main, the main purpose in day-to-day in, uh, -day reality, 
of the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, is to is to meet in that cabinet room with the president and all the other, mm-hmm. you know, um, national security advisors, and say, Mr. President. We we can't do that because it would be a war crime. Yeah. It would be aggression. I, I think that's the most important. You know, the U.S. Attorney General, all of these second-tier officials, their main responsibility, in my mind, is to say, you can't do that, Mr. President. <laughs> yeah. If only. You that can't. sounds wonderful. <laughs> uh, other pe- you know, in, in a corporate situation, it's like the guy who, who says, or, or a woman who says, that ain't going to work. Yeah. Well, the, the le- I'm sorry, we ran it by legal, and they said, uh, unfortunately, you, you can't poison. You spent a week on this <laughs> strategic plan, uh-huh. and, he, and that ain't going to work, and here's why. You know that person, but we we should have because when when a Secretary of State doesn't do that, yeah, he or she becomes a war criminal too. Yeah, and if there were consequences for that, one thinks that maybe people would stop. Exactly. You know, maybe you know <laughs> this is very optimistic, but maybe a reporter going losing their job for almost starting World War Three for quoting an unnamed source, maybe that will start some sort of avalanche of responsibility in, in journalism yeah that, that would be nice well I, you know the the theory is that better journalism leads to better leaders leads to better politicians i can understand that i believe it yeah that makes sense oh and bad you know the converse obviously horrible journalism uh, uh stenography for warmongers and mm-hmm. weapons manufacturers leads to horrible leaders yeah and that's that's really what we have like we have a lot of stenography we have a lot Uh of stenographers right now i don't know how to solve the crisis of journalism um maybe this dude losing his job is a step in the right direction but so much damage has been done Uh uh-huh yeah i don't i don't see how to come back well uh, i i talked about um the EU Parliament. Mm-hmm. Dec- All right, so a few months before that, 100 U.S. senators, all of them, mm-hmm. got together, yeah. had a vote, and said, yes, Vladimir Putin is a war criminal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, d- how does that support settling the war in Ukraine? America doesn't want to settle the war in Ukraine. I know, but but, but these are these are like yeah. one half of our legislative branch. Mm-hmm. Hundred senators, unanimous, even Rand Paul. Yeah, uh, votes, and my research over months has has I've concluded that he is not. He was not an aggressor. In February 22 or any time after yeah, that. I, the more convincing arguments about Putin tend to revolve around Chechnya and stuff like that. I, I, I don't consider it like, I don't consider what happened with Donetsk and Luhansk could be settled. But it's certainly enough, to, it's a strong court case. If this ever goes to court, you know, um, Russia's got a pretty good case there as far as I'm concerned. Um, people right. are, people don't want to listen to it precisely right. because it's a decent case. They They have evidence, lots of it. Uh, yeah. So these se- these 100 senators supposedly, yeah. you know, uh, it's supposed to be a, a, a premier debating forum. <laughs> Does anybody believe in that? America? <laughs> Does anybody and they all believe it? act like a herd of sheep yeah. and go along with what they're reading every day, hearing and, and watching on TV. Of course, he's a war criminal. Yeah. So we're all going to vote that he is. Well, they didn't think about what what implications, what effects that has on U.S.-Russia relations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've. Uh, how can we, if if Putin is in fact a war criminal, how can we p- even talk with him? America can't. the The people that it, that we have in charge are just an incredibly dire bunch, but they can't accept or even imagine that this is going to end for Putin any differently than it ended for um, Hussein or or Gaddafi. 
they think that Putin will be eventually murdered, overthrown, overthrown and murdered by people that uh, either in a show trial or right then and there by people in their own state, and that therefore they can they can skate on it. Nobody will ever pay attention to how it happened. You know uh, that that is simply not going to happen. No, that is not going to happen. Um, they don't seem Russia to... is winning. Yes, they are. I yeah no it's. Um, and I mean, I, I feel it's always important to mention that I love America and I would very much like America to not be losing this conflict. I don't want to be in this conflict at all. I don't think there's an ethical way for us to win it. So I don't want to be like, oh, America should be winning because we really messed up here. Like we have really, really made some terrible mistakes in Ukraine and people have not come to terms with how bad they are. I don't think we should win uh huh. But um, and we can't. Let's no. let's just. I mean, listen to we can retired provoke. Colonel Douglas McGregor. Mm -hmm. Listen to Scott Ritter. Listen to uh, several other. It was uh, obvious from the analysts. beginning. I mean, the people people. Okay, yeah. Like, and I, you know, I don't care for Ritter, but he is an intelligent man. Um, it, it's very obvious from the beginning. Like, we should have. Eh, <laughs> You don't even have to get into the specifics. We went from the graveyard of empires into a war against Russia in winter. <laughs> and they, well, you know, like even the. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you mean last February or yeah. winter, or winter? Well, now again, because we put it, we we uh, we. I mean, it wasn't we, but uh, America let Russia play for time the whole winter. I mean, the whole summer, and now we're to winter, and people are like the French foreign minister today is like russia is planning on using a winter as a weapon of war Con <laughs> congratulations yeah if you can go back in time 211 years you can save napoleon <laughs> don't, don't do that yeah, yeah thank you for yeah don't save napoleon don't, but no i mean don't don't invade yeah yeah it's like it is pleasant that that came from the french the french were like no no we've tried that one before no no <laughs> n'est pas bon um like yeah so like even on the folklore level like every red flag is up like just the idea like i mean even the most enthusiastic consumer of american propaganda has to admit that if you put joe biden and vladimir putin on two sides of a chess table yeah and are told to bet ten dollars <laughs> <laughs> you know and it's like I don't think it's un-American to say that. I want somebody who can compete at these highest levels. I also want somebody who's not a monster. I'd, I want both. But I want somebody who can handle this game at this highest level. And I know what happens to nations that go into war with bad leadership. Unpleasant what happens? things. Uh, unpleasant things. <laughs> it, <laughs> it doesn't work out. Um, either they suffer so terribly that they get good leadership or they lose. Right. And uh, I were running low on time and the new DJ's here. So I, I do want to say something like this is going to get me in more trouble than everything else we've said today. <laughs> but um, I swear to God, the people that the Ukraine, the people that Ukraine keep reminding me of, the Ukrainian junta, the Zelensky regime keep reminding me of are the CSA, the Confederate States of America, because that is another group of people that hastily provoked a war with the nation that provides all their necessities of life like iron steel yeah. shoe te shoe pegs <laughs> shoe pegs <laughs> you know I've, I've read you know me i've read extensively about the run-up to world war uh, to the civil war there are so many editorials from intelligent citizens of the south going like we cannot possibly win we don't even have the ability to make our own shoe pegs and that's exactly what did them in lack of shoes lack of industry well yeah but specifically lack of shoes that's why gettysburg happened is because they were walking around and they didn't have any shoes and they saw a newspaper ad that said there was a shoe factory in gettysburg <laughs> and that's why leach chose to cross and over and that's why lee finally lost most of his army he was trying to get shoes and then what amazing hap yeah and okay, okay and then what happens how does how does the civil war end well um hookworm Hookworm, because hookworm before the Civil War was a disease of miners, as in people that dig mines, because a hookworm can only, the parasite, the hookworm parasite, can only crawl about four feet. So, and, and it comes from defecation. So before miners in deep tunnels, because it was dark, they would all go to the same general tunnel 
and use it as a restroom. And because it was dark they, and they were barefoot, they would end up walking around in each other's feces. And so hookworm was an incredibly rare disease. But after the Civil War, the CSA lost all their dang shoes and they couldn't get any more shoes. It was the same problem they started with. They didn't have any shoes. And hookworm got into the population. And that is how hookworm spread through the South. And from 1860 to 1910, when they finally figured out what was going on, there was a huge pattern of malnourishment and anemia. And this is where the idea of the slovenly South came from, because everybody had hookworm and it caused anemia. Anyway, the point here is that it's not exactly the same situation, but the people in Ukraine, the leaders of Ukraine, have decided that they can provoke a war. And technically, the Union invaded the South, not the other way around. Technically, the Union started the war against the CSA. Um, the Union provoked it, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the CSA provoked it, but technically this, the Union did start the war against the CSA. And Ukraine has provoked a war that they cannot possibly win against the nation that controls the raw materials they need to live. To, to live. Like, mm -hmm. they're going to freeze to death. Yeah, or, or somehow get out of there. Go go to the west. Yeah. Go uh, go to Poland, where they also don't have heat because right. they've interrupted their own gas supply with a war that they can't possibly hope to win. And now, all these innocent people are going to suffer and die. Um, and if there's any karma, it's going to rebound on us, and that scares the dickens out of me. Anyway, <laughs> Mr. Young, your closing statements. Well, it's been a pleasure talking about these topics with you today. Yep. And uh, don't vote for a war criminal. Yeah, never vote for war criminals. A major one. Yeah, a major. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that we put DeSantis in office and then he commits a war crime and then we impeach then him. Then we impeach him. Yes, and, and I then, love that idea. And then the vice president takes over, whoever he picks for vice president. We impeach them. Uh, uh, they they yeah. have to commit war crimes yep. first <laughs> or fail to stop our current wars. war crimes. Yep. And we impeach them. And then it goes to a uh, Republican Speaker of the House. Impeach them if we have. We'll just keep impeaching until we find somebody who's not a war criminal. That is the plan. <laughs> it's not a bad plan. That's the plan, man. Well, well Mr. Young, it's been a <laughs> tremendous pleasure working with you this year. I'm, I'm so glad that we actually managed to make Central Kentucky care about um, foreign policy. It's almost over. I understand that next year when we get to work, it's going to be, it's going to be about COVID. Next year is going to be all it's about gonna COVID. It's going to be domestic policy. It's going to be what's good for the people of Kentucky. It's going to be COVID. Everybody's going to be fighting over COVID all next year because <laughs> we have discovered that there's more war in Ukraine than we want. And we want to get back. We want to talk about something else. Something we're used to. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to find out that there's more there than we want to talk about. Mr. E Mr. Young, anything else? or? Okay. Talk about something interesting for 30 seconds. No, 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 we don't even need that long because I've, I've got the button right here.